Hi, this is Brandon Butler, and this is Copyright Session 9, Copyright Risk Analysis, Remedies and Risk Reducers. One way to think about the risk involved in doing a particular thing, popular among economists and lawyers who wish they were economists, is to think about the expected value of taking that action. Multiply the magnitude of each outcome's goodness or badness as the result totally awesome or truly terrible, a $100,000 uh, profit or a $200,000 loss, by the likelihood of that outcome coming to pass. Is there a 20% chance of this will happen or an 80% chance? The sum of the resulting numbers can give you a sense of the overall risk reward for any course of action. When you think this way, a few interesting things emerge. If something is really, truly terrible or really, totally amazing, even a low likelihood of it happening can meaningfully change the overall value of your choice. This can explain the extreme risk aversion that many folks feel as they approach copyright. They've heard about the insanely high penalties imposed on folks for sharing just a few songs online, for example. So even if it seems unlikely that someone will sue you, you know that if they did, the, you have uh, some reason to worry that things could go very, very badly. Happily, we have several risk reducers in the copyright law that favor TDM research. First, Section 504C of the Copyright Act creates a special carve out for nonprofit educational institutions, libraries and archives, and their employees. When these folks have a good faith belief that their reproduction of copyrighted works is fair, courts are required to remit statutory damages, meaning they cannot award statutory damages. Only actual damages are available in these cases, and as we've probably seen, uh, the likely damages from text and data mining research are low to zero. Note, however, that this only applies to the reproduction right, uh, which is one of the several statutory rights in copyright law. So think about whether your uh, activity is going to distribute or adapt uh, or do other things rather than simply reproduce. Those activities are not covered. State sovereign immunity and qualified immunity are powerful tools that can protect state institutions and their employees against money damages in many cases, although the court can still order injunctions, meaning they can force you to stop your work. So this can be cold comfort for private institutions, unfortunately. They're not covered, only state institutions. Um, and the Supreme Court just recently uh, sided with the states and continued state sovereign immunity but Congress is now investigating this issue and they may choose to repeal state sovereign immunity. So keep your eyes uh, peeled. Timely registration is another interesting limitation on harm. Uh, if a work is not timely registered, then the copyright holder cannot seek statutory damages. Most commercial works, novels, academic journals, and databases are registered as a matter of routine, but other kinds of works typically are not. Amateur works such as snapshots, ephemera, uh, advertising material, old periodicals, unpublished and archival works are all much less likely to be registered uh, and may even have uh, risen into the public domain. If your corpus doesn't include commercial works, you may have a much lower risk because of this limitation on damages. There are several things you can do to sort of uh, reduce your risk when you're engaged in copyright relevant activities. One is uh, think about having a notice and takedown style policy for your research that can give concerned or aggrieved uh, stakeholders a channel for expressing themselves uh, and give you an opportunity to accommodate them without anyone ending up in court. Here's a hot tip though. You don't have to promise to take things down. And it can actually help shape expectations if you frame your notice mechanism in terms that are less negative. Uh, say something like, we welcome you to contact us to ask a question or share information about this research. Uh, another way to contain your risk is to ensure that you always provide reasonable attribution. This is something that's really important to some authors and rights holders and can go a long way to avoiding temper flare-ups. 
Uh, of course, some folks won't be satisfied with this, but surprisingly many people who raise complaints about content reuse are, or would have been, happy if only they had gotten the credit they felt they deserved. Finally, it's important to remember that plaintiffs face risk too. A recent study found that the average copyright case costs about $300,000 for the plaintiff to litigate all the way to a verdict. If a plaintiff loses, the courts have the discretion to force them to pay the defendant's attorney's fees and costs if the court finds that the suit was unwarranted. This is called fee shifting. There's also the Streisand effect, uh, bad press for those who bring nasty lawsuits against sympathetic people like researchers and libraries. Lots of defendants would rather avoid the Streisand effect. There are risks and rewards for any endeavor. Something bad might happen, yes, but if you forego a promising course of action, then you may sacrifice something good. Too often in academia, we treat all risks as unacceptable, and ignore the upside value of fulfilling our mission or the downside of failing to do so. The rational course is not to insist on zero risk of harm. It's to consider both the upsides and the downsides and make choices that are more likely to do good than harm.